Chapter 4 Presentation As the time approached when Mary was to be taken to the temple, St. Anne often gave her lessons, teaching her various prayers and rules of religion. She already knew how to read, though only three and a half years old and very delicate. Mary seemed like a girl of five or six. Her long, dark hair hung straight down with curls at the end. One day three old priests came from Nazareth to give her an examination in order to determine whether she was worthy of being accepted for service in the temple. This was a very solemn proceeding. After explaining to her the different duties she would fulfill, they asked her some questions. Her replies were so filled with naive wisdom that the priests could not help smiling their approval, while her parents wept tears of joy. Then, during a meal, the oldest priest said to her, In consecrating you to God, your father and mother promised that you would give up wine, vinegar, grapes, and figs. What other sacrifice do you wish freely to add to those? Think it over. Tell us later. Mary was very fond of vinegar. Meanwhile, the priests made it clear to her that she was still free to eat whatever she wanted, and all sorts of delicacies were offered to her, but she took very little, and from only a few dishes. After the meal in another room, Mary said that she had decided to give up fish and meat and milk and all fruits except berries. Also, she wished to sleep on the floor and to get up and pray three times every night. Her parents were deeply moved when they heard this. Taking her up in his arms, St. Joachim wept as he said to her, My dear child, that is far too much. If you lead such a hard life, your father will never see you again. The priests then insisted that she should pray only once during the night, like the other girls, that she should allow herself several other relaxations, and that she should eat fish on all the great feast days. They also told her that she would not have to join the poorer girls in washing the blood-stained robes of the sacrificers, but Mary unhesitatingly replied that she would willingly do that work if she were thought worthy. The priests were filled with surprise and admiration, and the oldest gave her a solemn blessing. Then St. Anne, who was deeply moved, pressed Mary to her heart and kissed her with tender love, while St. Joachim caressed her respectfully. Throughout the examinations, under the guidance and inspiration of her angels, Mary had remained perfectly recollected and serious, and at the same time strikingly beautiful and lovable. A few days later, everyone in St. Joachim's house was busy preparing for the trip to Jerusalem. Several fine ceremonial dresses, which had been made for Mary, were carefully packed up. Finally, one morning, at dawn, two donkeys were loaded with baggage and St. Joachim and St. Anne set out, the latter carrying Mary in her arms. The Holy Child was very happy to be going to the temple. During the trip they often had to travel through cold fogs, as it was the rainy season. When they stopped overnight at an inn or some friend's home, Mary often went up to her mother and joyfully put her arms around St. Anne's neck. Several times St. Joachim repeated sadly, My dear child, I will never see you again. On arriving in the holy city, they were met by a group of friends and children who led them to the house of Zacharias the priest, the future father of John the Baptist, where they were made welcome and given refreshments. Then everyone attended a great reception and feast in an inn which St. Joachim had rented for the occasion, as he wished to spare no expense for this great event. Among those present was a ten-year-old girl, later to be known as St. Veronica. Early the next morning, St. Joachim took his animal offerings to the temple with several men, while St. Anne, accompanied by many women and girls, led Mary to God's house in a beautiful, solemn procession through the streets of the holy city. Little Mary walked behind her mother. She was dressed in a lovely sky-blue robe with garlands of flowers around her arms and neck, and in one hand she carried a candle decorated with flowers. On each side of her were three girls in white with flowers and candles. Then came other girls and women. 
Everyone who saw them was touched by Mary's extraordinarily holy appearance. At the outer entrance to the temple, they were met by St. Joachim, Zacharias, and several other priests. As they passed through the gate, Mary's parents inwardly offered their beloved daughter to the Lord with a fervent and devout prayer. And Mary, too, in deep humility and adoration, offered herself to God. She alone perceived that the Almighty welcomed her and accepted her, for she heard a voice from heaven saying, Come, my beloved, my spouse, come into my temple where I wish thee to offer me praise and worship. Then, crossing the women's court, they came to the fifteen steps leading up to the great Nicanor Gate. It was here that St. Joachim and St. Anne had to make the formal offering of their child to the temple. After a priest had placed her on the first step, Mary, with his permission, turned and knelt before her parents. Kissing their hands with keen love and gratitude, she asked for their blessing and their prayers. With tears in their eyes, her father and mother laid their hands on her head and solemnly pronounced the words by which they gave her to the Lord, while a priest clipped a few locks of her hair. During this moving ceremony, the young girls who had come with the party sang these words of Psalm 44. Thou art beautiful, therefore hath God blessed thee forever. Hearken, O daughter, and see, and incline thy ear and forget thy people and thy father's house. And the king shall greatly desire thy beauty, for he is the Lord thy God. Therefore shall people praise thee forever, yea, forever and ever. Then, after St. Anne and St. Joachim had tenderly blessed her, little Mary, without hesitating and without looking back, began to climb up the fifteen steps. She would not let anyone help her, but with remarkable resolution and dignity she hastened up all by herself, filled with holy fervor and joy. Everyone who saw her was visibly affected. Two priests then led her up to the gallery from which the holy place could be seen and read some prayers over her while incense was burned on an altar. Taking from her the garlands of flowers and the candle, they put a brown veil over her head and conducted her to a hall in which ten girls in the service of the temple welcomed her by throwing flowers before her. Here she met her teacher, who was the holy prophetess Anna. As the priests left, Mary's parents and relatives came in to say goodbye. St. Joachim was especially moved. He took Mary into his arms and wept as he murmured, My child! Pray to God for my soul. St. Anne embraced her beloved daughter sadly and tenderly. Then, resigning herself with courage to the will of God, she turned away. As she walked out, she said to the women accompanying her, The Ark of the Covenant is now in the temple. With keen sorrow in their hearts, St. Joachim and St. Anne returned to Nazareth. But in answer to Mary's prayers, God mercifully consoled and comforted them. Now Mary humbly knelt before her teacher, Anna, and asked her blessing and forbearance for the trouble she would give her. Next, Mary greeted and embraced each of the other girls, offering herself as their servant and urging them to instruct and command her. After taking a meal together, they retired to their little cells. Mary's room was high up with a view over the holy place and the inner temple containing the Holy of Holies. Her cell was very plain, its only furniture being a lamp, a low round table, and a rolled up carpet which served as her bed. As soon as she found herself alone, Mary prostrated herself on the floor and kissed it, for to her it was holy ground, being part of God's temple, and she considered herself unworthy of treading upon it. Then she turned to her angels and prayed. Messengers of the Almighty, faithful friends, I beseech you to remain with me in this holy temple of my Lord and to remind me of all that I should do. Please instruct me and direct me so that in all things I may fulfill the will of God. Humbling herself before God, she said, Infinite and eternal Lord, 
if trouble and persecutions suffered in patience are precious in thy sight, do not consent that I be deprived of so rich a treasure and pledge of thy love. But give the rewards of these tribulations to those who deserve them better than I. This prayer of Mary pleased Almighty God, and He gave her to understand that He would allow her to suffer and labor for love of Him during her life, though she would not know in advance how it would happen. Mary thanked Him with all her heart, and then asked to be allowed to take in His presence the vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, and perpetual enclosure in the temple. The Lord answered, My chosen one, Thou dost not yet understand why it is impossible for thee to fulfill all thy desires. The vow of chastity I permit and wish thee to make, and from this moment I want thee to renounce earthly riches. It is my will that thou observe whatever pertains to the other vows as if thou hast made them. Then the holy child solemnly made the vow of chastity before God, and renounced all affection for created things, while she resolved to obey all creatures for the love of God. Her angels proceeded to adorn her with a gorgeous robe and sparkling jewels of many colors that symbolized her virtues. Next the Lord told her to ask for whatever she desired, and Mary immediately beseeched him with burning fervor to send the Redeemer to the world so that all men might know him, to bless her parents with grace, and to console the poor and the afflicted in their troubles. The Blessed Virgin said to St. Bridget of Sweden, From my infancy the Holy Spirit was perfectly with me, and as I grew it filled me so completely as to leave no room for any sin to enter. When I had attained an age to know something of my Creator, I turned to him with unspeakable love and desired him with my whole heart. I vowed in my heart to observe virginity if it was pleasing to him and to possess nothing in the world. But if God willed otherwise, that his will, not mine, be done, I committed my will absolutely to him. <laughs> 